Hey guys, welcome back to another video. I'm going to round up my books of December um, that I read that sort of fell off my radar a bit because I was like busy making end of year lists. But I thought some of these were really good and I wanted to share them with you and some of them I didn't love but I think are quite popular so maybe that would also be of interest to you. I've got five here to show you and three that I don't so that makes eight books in total for December which is pretty good. I um, was busy as lots of people were doing Christmas things, socialising, resting etc so I didn't read as many as I normally do but yeah I think it was a pretty good reading month and I think my January reading month has been off to an even better start so that's good. Let us start with um, physical books. So I read Sean Hewitt's All Dark, All Down Darkness Wide. This was lent to me by a friend. Um, so this is their copy and I moved between this and the audio book of it actually. And this is a story of, it's a memoir of Sean's experiences being in love with someone who was depressed. I would say that's like part, like that's the main thesis of the book, but it does also talk about queerness, his experience, particularly it growing up in Ireland and being a young gay man and how that interacted with his experience of internalised homophobia and shame and then that paired with sort of mental health issues so I did like this book but I didn't love it as much as I really really wanted to I think some of it is quite profound he's a poet so he traces a lot of the work back to his um like PhD thesis which is about like 19th century poetry I can't remember who it's about sorry someone famous I don't know um but it's about the relationship between him and this man called Elias or Elias and they moved to Gothenburg which is where his partner's from and he continues his PhD and his partner looks at work they both meet like abroad traveling and then try and make it work long distance and he eventually moves out like I said to Gothenburg with him and Sean tries to learn local language and sort of integrate himself and they're both experiencing to be honest quite like severe forms of loneliness despite the fact having this romance and this relationship with each other and it's a pretty harrowing story of um mental ill health and wanting to save someone who can't be saved and it talks about the detriment that mental illness had on that relationship to me it sort of teetered on the edge of like telling someone else's story that wasn't yours to tell I don't obviously know the personal moral ethics of Sean Hewitt and how he um sort of came to tell the story of someone else and whether that was like pre-agreed upon or whether they're still friends and stuff like that but it felt like to me the most like emotionally invested I was was in the experience of his partner not necessarily of him I do like the chapters when he went back to sort of his upbringing in his childhood I found those much more compelling than um some of the more recent writing but yeah it just didn't it didn't quite do it for me in the way that I had hoped and I'd be interested if other people had read it as well that's the first one and I read a very short non um novella We the Animals by Justin Torres this is Tom's and he read it ages ago and it's set in um upstate New York and it's about three brothers growing up together but really it's a story of violence and sort of um, domestic abuse and uh, sibling rivalry and sort of sibling to sibling complications it's told in the collective we which I think some people again find jarring but I did find quite notable in this circumstance it's very colourful in its writing and its depictions of childhood but overall I found it pretty harrowing if I'm honest but um yeah one I haven't heard much talk about and I did really enjoy it I read it in a day it's only like 120 pages and it sort of yeah marks out these different experiences in the young boys lives like a chapter called the zoo the trench the night i am made the night i am lost yeah it's very um poetic and cerebral in places but not in that like annoying childlike naivety way that i sometimes find frustrating i think that it was yeah an interesting voice and also the commentary on motherhood within here was also very interesting to me so that's We Are the Animals. Then I read a short story collection. This is Sarah Lamb by Sam Cohen. This took me ages to read, which I think is part of what contributed to why it didn't really pull off for me. There were some stories in here I really enjoyed. The one about the sorority sisters called Sarah. And it's basically a set of queer stories talking about different experiences of 
relationships and sort of how heteronormative late capitalist society has failed so many people. I did like some of the stories a lot, particularly there's one about this lesbian couple who wants to become trees and sort of age out of the world and another story about two sex workers which I really liked and yeah some of them are more memorable but they are quite fantastical. There was like one about the bible and some other quite like meta other worldly ones that didn't really do it for me and I think um, I did actually skip quite a few in here which was unlike me for a short story collection normally I give them a go but I think also the time I was reading this I really wanted to read but every time I picked it up it like wasn't what I was looking for at the time which I think was perhaps my fault but yeah that was that short story collection. For my Amsterdam book club we read small things like these by Claire Keegan and you would have seen I picked up Foster when I was in Margate on my trip so that would suggest I did enjoy this at least somewhat and I did really enjoy this if I'm honest I know it's got a lot of different people's opinions about it particularly for its length and sort of what it's trying to do but I thought Claire Keegan's illustration of the laundries was really well done and without being schooling I think she made a really strong point here about soft power so it follows one man who is the owner of the local coal yard and is on his rounds at Christmas time dropping off um, resources for people in the community and he comes across a girl who's locked in the coal shed of what he now finds out is the laundries if you don't know about the Magdalene laundries they were a or like a number of institutions across Ireland during I think they started in the 70s the last one closed down really not that long ago um and I think it was only in 2013 where um some women received some form of justice for what happened to them but they were basically incarcerated unmarried women who were pregnant taken in by the church because at that point in Irish history church and state were wedded and there was no ability for someone to have a baby outside of wedlock that was considered you know forbidden illegal inappropriate so they were kept away in these mother and baby homes and in these laundries the babies were often fostered or sent out to quite often to American families who were unable to have their own children so they were sent away and the mothers had no record of where their child went and then they were also forced to work in these laundries doing the washing basically enslaved um, and it's a horrific piece of history that has failed to be discussed in lots of different circles whether that's um, in the UK or otherwise and this book sort of sheds a light on that in a small way and it follows one man his discovery of the laundries and his understanding of female oppression in Ireland and I think it's full of flawed characters, particularly our main character. What's his name? Bill. I always want to call him Phil, even though that's not a very Irish name. Um, and there's this sort of convoluted story about his own history and his own mother. And I think there was potential for this to be a bit saccharine. But I think the way Keegan illustrated Bill as this morally flawed man who was just sort of unaware of things that experiencing outside of his identity was interesting and I think yeah the illustration of soft power through the nuns holding voice across the community and Bill having to come to terms with his own daughters and sort of if he were to do something about the laundries what would that mean for his daughters who were schooled by the nuns and yeah it was an interesting inversion of power in terms of the widespread oppression of women at the time and then the nuns being the key holders of this community and holding so much without with saying so little so yeah I thought it was well well constructed in that way and I think if it went on any longer I would have definitely said it felt fable-like and moralistic but because it ended where it did I think that left room for interpretation and like I say is a great piece of Irish history to learn about so that is um small things like these I put on my book club instagram some other like documentary and stuff if you've read this and you want to learn more about the laundries there's a few different things out there you can consume and then i read Strega by johan like home i was disappointed in this one if i'm honest i've seen it on a few top 10 lists and i found that quite confusing i think the aesthetics of this book is beautiful and the copy of it is pretty nice to look at but i don't think the story did anything out of the ordinary for me so it follows a group of girls who are housemaids workers in this dilapidated hotel that was previously quite renowned in an alpine village and it follows a I think it says on the back doesn't it that something happens yeah a girl disappears and you sort of follow the investigation but it never really comes to anything and I know that's sort of the point and that's often quite common in translated fiction they don't follow those narrative arcs that we're perhaps used to in our English reading experiences but to me it didn't even say anything profound without having solution it just sort of ended like a wet blanket 
it's very ethereal in its illustration and then there's this backstory about nuns that never really came to anything that I was very interested in as well and ghostly a few dream sequences and things like that which all added up to me just being feeling quite meh about it but I would be interested if anyone's read this and really loved it and can tell me why because yeah there was like some one-off lines I really enjoyed and I stuck with it but honestly towards the end it felt like a slog even though it was only 180 pages long which I feel like is a bit of a disappointment so beautiful book but not much substance between the pages in my humble opinion and then I listened to Raven Smith's Men. I do own a physical copy of this because I know Tom's read it, but I think my friend must have it and I didn't get it back from her when I saw her in London. But this is Raven Smith's second essay collection, his previous one, Trivial Pursuits, I loved a lot. And this second one is much more um, cohesive in its undertaking because it, it understands masculinity from a personal conversation as Raven Smith as a mixed race gay man and his understanding of masculinity in relation to queerness and his upbringing and then also sort of wider questions on things like diet culture and celebrity and I think it's it was a lot more sincere than his previous collection but it was still very funny and I think Raven Smith has a certain flavour of humour that I find very British and for that I find very comforting but I know other people perhaps don't find him funny and even like other British friends I have don't find him funny but to me he really like epitomises things I find funny um so that's Raven Smith he's a great follower on Instagram if you don't already follow him but this um essay collection like I say is about masculinity there's an essay in here that I loved so deeply that I'm going to think about so much and it's all about step parenting and he talks about his relationship to his stepfather how no one signs up to be a step parent and how it's quite thankless and he sort of traces back his relationship to his mum being raised a single being raised by a single mum and then when his mum found you know, a second chance at love, how that really um, relieved some of this internal struggle he had about abandoning his mum for his own adult life and sort of how he feels safe in the knowledge that his mum has this beautiful man that cares for her. And I thought, yeah, I just loved what he said about that. And I feel like I haven't read much about step families, even though that's like a very common, particularly like in my social circle and friendship groups have so many people with step parents and it's never something I thought twice about, but the way he wrote about it was really quite profound and I enjoyed it. And then the essay that followed that was also about his husband and obviously the masculinity that they present in their gay marriage and also the joy of being married to someone. And it really, I really flip flop between my opinions of marriage and, you know, marriage as an institution versus marriage as a personal choice. But the way he spoke about it and sort of the enduring love that him and his husband have for each other. I found incredibly beautiful and it was levied with these jokes and these backhanded comments that was like very Raven Smith but felt um yeah sort of I guess got rid of that soppy thing which he says himself he hates writing so I loved that there was one essay in here oh there was another essay that I loved about um suicidality and um Raven Smith losing a flatmate to suicide and how which I was talking about before that hierarchy of grief and the understanding of losing someone who's not like your best friend or your mum or your dad just someone you're like tangentially related to but you did know and like them leaving left a hole in your life and sort of how you deal with that and he had a lot of personal guilt about the circumstances of his friends and his flatmate's death and that was pretty harrowing to read but like really interesting I hadn't read a story about um yeah that tangential loss before the only essay I took issue with the one was the one where he writes about sort of his opinions on me too and some of that felt ill thought out or just like private in a way that I didn't want to read about and sort of didn't feel like was relevant um it almost felt like he wanted to absolve himself of guilt of something that he had done in the past but there were some bits in I found interesting particularly on like um gay culture and his experience of growing up and like his formative sexual experiences as a young gay man and how he reflects on those now as like what we know and what we've learned and sort of me too in a heteronormative sense and me too in his community and I thought that was really interesting but overall I think that essay kind of missed the mark for me and then I read speaking of sex I read <coughs> Acts of Service by Lillian Fisherman. I list Fisherman. I listened to this on audio, which I'm not going to say I recommend. If you've read this, then you will probably know. And I don't know why. I definitely wasn't listening to my friends. I will tell myself that. CJ and Jay both read this. And I just remember them enjoying it. I don't remember them telling me it was like Queer Fifty Shades of Grey, which basically is what it is. Like it's a very sexually explicit book about a threesome and an ongoing relationship but it is interesting because it talks a lot about class dynamics and also biphobia 
but it's like also just a lot of sex writing which I actually thought was pretty well done and I have a really low tolerance for cringe when it comes to stuff like that I'm not a prude but I just find a lot of like those intimate writing scenes really poorly done and I think because this one was so explicit it like went in it was much better than when they try and make it really poetic and flowery and not actually talk about you know the physical acts that are going on so I applaud Lillian Fishman for that and overall I thought it was really well done it was a quick read and <clears throat> it was just like not really what I expected but then by the time I'd realized I was like too far in and because I like to listen to my audiobook sometimes when I first wake up when I'm sort of just like deciding what to do with my day it was like quite full on you know to be confronted by that at like 8 30 on a Monday but would recommend it I think if you are going into it knowing that that's what you're going to get um and then finally I read a book this I didn't think I was going to finish this but I finished this at like I don't know 9 or 10 30 on New Year's Eve so I was obviously in the mood for reading but this is Death of a Bookseller by Alice Slater it's not out until I think April um and it's a literary thriller ish and it is detestable in the best way possible has some really awful characters so you flip flop between two points of view and it's set around a Walthamstow bookshop that is basically Waterstones it's called Spines and it's like about a chain of bookstores but they're basically Waterstones and um you follow two women one who's been working at the bookshop for a really long time and one who's like newly come in to sort of boost the christmas sales and sort things out and i don't want to give a lot of it away because it's very um yeah plotty and twisty and it's in terms of these two women disliking each other it's all centers around their opinions of true crime and i think the way alice slater wrote about the true crime discourse was really interesting in here and like raised a lot of interesting points i'd already thought about but never read anyone concretely put into fiction like i love when people go in on the research for something in a fiction novel like that if that makes sense um so yeah it talks a lot about true crime discourse one of them is like a huge true crime podcast fan one of them is a tangentially related to like a is a victim of true crime and you watch these two women hate each other over the course of a few months there's love interest there's stalking and quite a violent sort of ending and it's it's quite absurd like Moshvekian in some ways that it um approaches violence and detestable women but I thought it was really good it was like putting me in a bad mood when I was reading it though which I feel awful about saying but I've noticed recently I feel really affected by the books that I read and sort of I read it so when I was like waiting for dinner and I was like suddenly found myself quite hungry and I was like snapping at Tom and I was like why am I doing that and I was like this book is making me angry because the characters were just so fucking annoying but like not in a they were written badly way just in like you can picture these people you know exactly what they're like especially the one character Laura I was like I know I can picture her and I know how annoying she is and that's why I'm finding this so annoying um but yeah one to look out for I think it's out in April like I say and it's getting a US and UK like dual publication so whichever side of the pond you are on you can uh take a gander at that one and it's also a net galley if you fancied it over there so yeah that are all the books I read those are all the books I read in December hope you guys had a good reading month and your reading year is off to a good start and I will see you all in the next one bye